Good day. My name is Konstantina Velkushanova, and I'm going to speak about the characterization of fecal sludge. I'm going to stress mainly on the qualitative um, assessment and um, properties of fecal sludge, as well as on the standard operating procedures for fecal sludge. The qualitative um, characterization has been already covered by Linda Strande in one of the other keynote speeches, and for that reason, I'm not going to cover it. I work at the Pollution Research Group uh, at the University of KwaZulu Natal, which is based in Durban, South Africa, and have been working in the field of um, water and sanitation for the last four years, uh, particularly focused on fecal sludge characterization. What are the characteristics of fecal sludge and how do they vary? The fecal sludge characteristics are very heterogeneous. They depend on many factors, including environmental factors, such as um, geographical location, the demography of the region, then also climate uh, conditions, the presence of underground water table, and um, also soil type. The Type of on-site sanitation uh, technologies is also an important factor, as well as the quality of the construction. Also, we have the um, age of the sludge and the filling rates. So the slower the filling rates, the, the less frequent the emptying of the sanitation facility would be, and then the more aged the sludge would be. So the more aged the sludge would be, then the more stabilized would be. Then also we have another factor, which is uh, the toilet use, which is defined by different um, specifications, such as number of users and their diet. Also the frequency of the use, um, the, whether the toilets are dry or wet, whether they are flush toilets or there is no water introduced into the system. Also, what is the culture of the toilet use, whether the most of the people are wipers or washers, as well as uh, the addition of additives to the sanitation system changes significantly the characteristics of the sludge and um, the disposal of gray, and, uh, gray water and trash into the system as well as the frequency of the, the emptying and whether this is mechanized or manual. According to this, we can distinguish between different types of fecal sludge. We can classify them by the type of on-site sanitation sources, such as uh, pit latrines, um, septic tanks, dry toilets, such as urine diversion or comp uh, composting toilets. Also, depending on the age, the storage, or the source treatment, we can have um, stabilized or digested sludge, semi-digested sludge, or fresh sludge. Uh, depending on the type of use, on the type of, um, of, of system, whether we flush or not, we can have wet or dry. Coming back to the fecal sludge treatment targets and objectives, the main aim is to provide safe environmental and um, public health, which supports the entire chain of fecal sludge management, starting from um, treatment, dis discharge, and use or disposal. To meet this aim, and there are a number of objectives set, which are um, pathogen inactivation, stabilization of the organic and the nutrient um, matters, and also the safe end use and disposal. The dewatering is an important step because this, uh, this provides um, significant reduction of the volume of the fecal sludge, which makes it a lot easier for transportation or further treatment. So what are the important parameters for fecal sludge characterization? I have summarized in a table uh, some of the most commonly used um, and essentially the most important parameters for fecal sludge characteristics. Some uh, parameters are not included here. This doesn't mean that they are not important for specific types of technologies or specific purposes. But then this is a broad summary. 
I have grouped them into four categories, and the first one is chemical properties. Um, these include moisture content, total solids, um, suspended solids, ash content, and volatile so content, solids content. Also, um, COD could be total or fractionations of the COD, pH, also ammonium, PKN, phosphates, autophosphates, potassium, etc. In the last uh, column, I have included the reason and the importance of why we need to determine these kind of properties. For example, if we take the moisture content, this gives us an assessment of the mechanical behavior of the fecal sludge as a material for processing like mixing, drying, um, flowing, or combusting. It is also an indicator about the biodegradation potential of a sludge, knowing also the age and the COD in uh, combination with the COD values. And also, it's a good indication about the potential migration of pathogens. If, for example, um, we take the ammonia, PKN, phosphates content, and potassium, this gives us the nutrient recovery the potential nutrient recovery values um, given that the fecal sludge has been treated for pathogen inactivation. The next group is physical and mechanical properties such as density, particle size distribution. Also, we have sludge volume index, osmotic pressure, rheological properties, and sludge penetration resistance. Why are these important? They provide a background information which could be quite essential for the design of pit emptying devices or mechanical treatment of fecal sludge. If we take, for example, the rheological properties, um, they give a good estimation of the change of the viscosity with um, increasing shear rate, which also provides um, the, the essential information for design of uh, pit emptying equipment and also mechanical treatment processes. The next group is thermal properties. They're mainly important for thermal um, different uh, thermal um, treatment processes or um, design facilities. Um, for um, processing such as combustion, combustion heating, um, and um, drying. Uh, here we have incorporated um, thermal conductivity, specific heat, and calorific value. Um, also, the last group is called biological properties, which incorporates parasites content and pathogen content. Uh, they are very important, coming back to the aim at the, treat, the fecal sludge treatment, um, providing safe public and environmental health. So if we take, for example, the ascaris content, um, this is a very important indicator. Why? Because the ascaris eggs are very resistant um, to any type of treatment technologies. So it's considered that if we manage with a certain treatment technology to destroy the ascaris eggs, then supposedly we have been destroyed already any other pathogens present in the sludge. What are then the m challenges when we measure such fecal sludge properties? We mentioned already that the fecal sludge is highly heterogeneous and varies between different conditions or different sanitation uh, facilities. So if we take... Um, sludge for, coming from different on-site sanitation facilities, the properties may vary highly. But also, if we take the, um, the sludge from coming from one and the same type of on-site sanitation facilities, but from different toilets, we can, have, we, we can um, observe a high variation as well in the properties, depending on the number of users, the load, etc. factors that we mentioned early on. And for that reason, we also have um, high variation of the properties when we collect sludge coming from one and the same toilet facility. Why? Because we, at the different sections of the sludge, um, you have um, different degradation rate, 
um, has different moisture content and this would also result in um, heterogeneity of the sludge properties within one and the same toilet facility. So what is the correct approach for measuring the fecal sludge properties then? This would be the development of standard methods and procedures, or so-called standard operating pr procedures for fecal sludge analysis. They could be applicable for the sampling process, for all the different analyses we mentioned, um, whether the analyses are performed in the field or in the lab conditions, and also uh, covering all the health and safety procedures during the entire process of sampling, transportation, storage, analysis, and disposal. So the SOPs having standard operating procedures is important for in many fields uh, for various reasons. Some of them are summarized here, like consistency and reliability of the data, also good quality control, efficiency of the, of the, met of the testing methods, um, reduction of the errors, and health and safe work environment. Currently, there are no standard operating procedures for fecal sludge measurement, and standard methods for uh, water, wastewater, and soil are adapted. For, for the fecal sludge. However, these methods are not the most suitable because the fecal sludge differs in its characteristics by this method. As we said, it's highly heterogeneous, but it also has higher um, solid content compared to, um, to water or wastewater. And then we have a, a high variation even between the different um, different sludges coming from the different on-site sanitation facilities. So the lack of standard methods for fecal sludge results in, in incomparable data sets generated between different regions and institutions, which is already raising a problem. What would be the way forward? Um, there is a need of collaboration between institutions working on um, um, fecal sludge characterization for development of um, standard operating procedures for fecal sludge characterization. And this will not be a once-off task because the methods evolve and change over the time. So I'm going to move to an example from the Pollution Research Group where we did a development of standard operating procedures for fecal sludge and we did research on certain properties. So first of all, to start, we have a specialized sanitation laboratory which, um, um, which analyzes a lot of um, samples from uh, fecal sludge, um, different excreta, human excreta, such as urine or fresh feces. Also, we analyze wastewater or sludge coming from wastewater treatment works. For um, a bit more details, you can have a look at our website. What we also have is during the last couple of years, uh, because we have been working extensively with properties of fecal sludge, analyzing and then investigating, um, then we have developed a standard operating procedure manual which um, is specialized for fecal sludge. So we have a couple of sections there. The first one is administration section, which um, is focused on the different documents that need to be filled in before we go to the field for sampling or before, before we receive sludge samples from somewhere or before we initiate any further analysis. The next sections incorporate already the different groups I've already mentioned of properties, although in our menu there are a lot more properties mentioned and it's given in a lot more details. And then there is another section which incorporates the laboratory health and safety um, standard operating procedures covering the entire 
process. For more information, you can download our um, standard operating procedure manual for FICO sludge from our website again. And I would like just to stress on the fact that we call it um, an SOP manual for FICO sludge, but that's our internal document so far. We have disseminated this document to a lot of our partners. They have been using it as a basis for their methods, uh, and that's the way to go uh, forward. But this is not an official document that has been issued for FICO sludge yet. So I'm going to move on to a specific study I have been working on, which is called Mechanical Properties of FICO sludge. Uh, why? Because it incorporates um, quite a lot of um, properties of fecal sludge that have been studied, and it gives a good example of what is the importance to do analysis and uh, characterization of fecal sludge in a good quality and using standard operating procedures. Uh, the, the project is funded by the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. It has been already completed. Uh, the main objectives were to generate first-hand data for fecal sludge characteristics from dry on-site sanitation facilities in um, Durban, South Africa. And then the other objective was to provide data for improved design or sizing of pit emptying devices um, or devices for transport and processing uh, of sludge. There was an extensive pit tempting program focusing on dry on-site sanitation facilities. Um, we have emptied um, a number of different um, ventilated uh, improved pit latrines, which were on a household level or community ablution block or school level. Also, urine uh, diversion toilets and an improved pit latrines. We have also aimed at um, a different usage level, which incorporated low use with less than five users per facility or high use with over five users per facility. And then when the project started, we firstly proceeded with the sampling. So what we realized then is that no matter how good our standard operating methods for testing and analysis in the laboratory are, because of the heterogeneity um, um, of the fecal sludge, we have um, actually questionable data set once again when we speak about sampling. So, for example, we, I mentioned early on that we can have large variation between sludges coming from one and the same type of facility or from different ones. So how do we ensure when, when they have different filling rates, when they have different age, how do we ensure that the data is comparable between each one of them? So what we did firstly was with the dry household ventilated improved pit latrines, we selected samples from um, 10 dry and um, later on 10 wet um, pit latrines. So what we did was um, we uh, collected samples from different, um, different heights of the sludge, which was accumulated in the pit, and actually developed a method which was followed for all the other pits that have been sampled. Why? Because following um, previous references coming from um, Chris Buckley, um, actually it's possible to discover um, different layers which are visually distinctive depending on their age or the level of degradation. So, for example, the first layer of the pit was um, very fresh. And probably the sludge accumulated there was a week Old. Then the second layer would be partly degraded. Um, the third layer would be furthermore degraded, and there would be a visual distinction between those two layers. And then the bottom layer was a very thick, dark, soil-like uh, material, which was visibly um, stabilized or very much biodegraded. So 
we divided the pit into two sections, the front and the back section, and then collected samples, four from the front, four from the back. And then the same method was used for each other um, pit we have been um, selecting, um, dry household pit, and compared the data between the different layers or as a composite sample. For the wet uh, VAPs, um, they're called wet not because there is any flush water used, but because the um, pit, for some reason, was full of um, liquid. We, we established that the most of these pits uh, that we, we discovered were at the bottom of the hill, and although there was no scientific evidence, we think that there, there was something to do with um, underground water um, infiltration or, or, the um, or the effect of the rainy season. So what we discovered was that um, we had um, liquid uh, in the pit and then the sludge was concentrated at the top. So we developed a different method for sampling from this pit uh, because it was not exactly comparable with the previous dry ventilated improved pit latrines. For urine diversion toilets, again, we developed a different type of um, sampling method, sampling procedure, which um, incorporated two types of votes, active and inactive vote. The active one was already in use and the sludge was a lot more fresh. And then for the inactive or the standing vote, the sludge was a lot more dry and stabilized because it hasn't been used for a certain um, period of time. So the users have been using this valve first. Once the, it was filled up, they would move the toilet and then start using this one. While they're using the second one, the sludge would be aging and stabilizing in the first vault. For um, school ventilated improved pit latrines, we had a similar um, method as for the, the first one, um, the household pits. We also had unimproved pit latrines where um, they have already not been in use when at the time we went sampling. Um, and then uh, we just dug holes and collected samples from different levels of the pit. So just to summarize, what is the importance when we do, when we develop fecal sludge sampling methods? Um, the sampling should be, first of all, based on the local fecal sludge management context. Why? I was speaking about pit latrines, which are very appropriate for the context of um, Southeast Africa. But for example, if you go to Southeast Asia, where we have uh, poor flush toilets, uh, which, uh, and the sludge, um, is collected into um, um, septic tanks, then the context of sampling would be completely different. Maybe it would come from the truck or um, because the sludge is uh, very much liquid, a different technology would be developed. Uh, then also the sampling methods should fit the end use of the data. So it depends what we need the data for that's how we need to develop an appropriate sampling method for. For example, if we, if we need a large amount of sludge for testing of a new prototype, then we don't need to collect the different small samples. We need to collect a composite sample of the, of the entire pit. Then um, the standardized methods should be applicable for the different types of on-site sanitation facilities, what we already mentioned. We can't apply one and the same method for every type of on-site sanitation facility because it won't be applicable simply. And then uh, the sampling timeline must be coordinated with the laboratory analysis because um, we would like to avoid storing samples for a long time and it's better to collect them, to transport um, and store them for a short time and then um, perform the analysis. So from all these selected samples, a number of analyses were performed. Um, that's the list of the analyses that we 
undertook. However, I'm, I have selected just a number of them to show you as an example as well here. For example, if we go to the moisture content, this is the data set we have generated from all the samples and all the repetitions during the analysis. That's why we have a total number of nearly um, 600 samples. So what we see, for example, in red, we see the dry ventilated improved pit latrines, and we see a wide range of uh, moisture content. This uh, varies depending on the location of the pit that the sample was selected, also um, depending on the number of users, um, et cetera, et cetera, factors that we mentioned early on. So what we observed is that um, within these, um, these pits, we had um, a varia uh, variation um, between 60 to probably 90% of moisture content, where the average, the total average and mean value from all the samples was at about 80%. For the um, wet VAPs, these are the analysis only from the sludges accumulated on the top of the pit. We have not included uh, the, um, the liquid phase. Uh, it, it shows a pretty similar tendency as for the dry VAPs. Then for in yellow, I uh, described the older the, um, samples that we have collected from urine diversion toilets. These samples um, show a larger variation because, we, as we said, we had a, um, an active pit and a standing pit uh, or vaults where um, in the standing vaults the moisture content was much lower because a stabilization process was taken place. And then uh, similarly in the unimproved pit latrines where the sludge was quite aged, we had a much lower moisture content. If we go to the ash content, we see an even higher variation of the, of the properties. For example, for um, dry household VAPs, the ash content varies between 0 0.2 to 0 0.8 grams um, per gram dry mass. It is very important to stress on the fact that we have been using um, dimensions expressing the properties in gram per gram dry or uh, gram per gram total solids. Why? Because all the sludges vary significantly within their moisture content. And um, unlike um, wastewater where the moisture content is over 98, 99%, here we have a large variation as we saw early on. And we would like to have a basis for comparison, a more stable basis for comparison of the data. So that's why we have been expressing it into uh, gram per gram total solids. So we see, for example, here for the urine diversion toilets, we have a much higher ash content, which is also, again, um, coming from the standing or in the inactive vaults. The total COD also varies quite significantly. For uh, the higher values, they usually come from the top layers where we have um, a very fresh um, sample. It, it varies between um, zero to, or nearly zero to 1.6 grams COD per gram total solids or dry sample. Um, we can see that the stabilization process for some of the urine diversion toilets and some of the aged um, samples from the unimproved pit latrines has taken place. The pH variation was also um, quite significant. However, we had uh, established a range. The average values, for example, for um, dry and wet VAPs was something between 7.5 to 8. 
The calorific value also presented a very good variation. There is a correlation between, expectedly, there is a correlation between the um, COD values and the um, calorific values. Um, the age samples, such as um, unimproved pit latrines, um, demonstrated much lower calorific value than some of the fresh um, samples. Then the, the average calorific value was about um, 15 uh, megajoules per uh, kilogram, which is very close to, to the one of wood. Then if we move to the rheological properties, um, it was observed that the fecal sludge um, has a shear thinning with the increasing shear rate, which means that it turns into more liquid with the increasing shear rate, which is um, good for the design of pit, uh, pit emptying devices and pumping. Um, then we have particle size distribution within one and the same pit at the different sections, what was demonstrated early on. We did some uh, studies on the trash content of um, um, pits or the trash content mixed with fecal sludge in some of the on-site sanitation facilities we have analyzed. Uh, we did a menu categorization from three or four different uh, on-site sanitation facilities. And then we categorize them by different material groups, such as paper, soft plastics, um, hair extensions, menstrual products, textiles, glass, etc. So what was the distribution? Um, this shows what was the organic uh, fraction, which was um, attributed to um, fecal sludge mainly. Um, so it showed a distribution between 85 to 95 percent by weight mass. And then for, um, for the different um, other material groups, we had a distribution of 2 to 3 percent by weight maps. So the conclusions of the study, we've already passed through the most of the information, just shows um, 75 to 85 percent moisture content for all the VAP samples, 61 percent for urine diversion toilets. Uh, the average calorific value was between 11 to 50 megajoules per kilogram. What we said for the age samples were just five. Um, it's important also to mention, um, it didn't come on the slide, but uh, we did quite a lot of analysis on helmet eggs or ascaris content. And the most of the helmet eggs demonstrated um, values higher than the limit set by the World Health Organization, which is one helmet egg per uh, gram of uh, total solids, which, um, which shows that this sludge needs to be treated further for pathogen inactivation. So just to come up, the most important part of the study was what were the outcomes? We got some results, but actually the most important part was what did we achieve uh, as a result of this study? First of all, we developed a fecal sludge sampling methods and techniques which uh, also helped us um, to develop uh, standard operational procedures for analysis of fecal sludge. Um, the study was a baseline for further stimulus studies by other organizations because we submitted, um, we disseminated our knowledge and we collaborated with other organizations to provide a similar platform of study. And then we disseminated the crucial support information required by other partner organizations for pit tempting um, or other treatment technologies designs. Just to pass quickly um, to give an, an example about the different organizations we have been collaborating with. This is just a small list of them. And just to show you what this study helped with or how we um, collaborated to, to um, develop different, to support them in developing different technologies. Uh, that's the Asian Institute of Technologies with their solid septic tank and hydrocyclone toilet. 
California Institute of Technology, Climate Foundation for Biochar, production of, um, from um, pico sludge, nanomembrane toileting, Cranfield University, Delft University of Technology with their plasma-driven gasification system, Duke University with uh, supercritical ox water oxidation, um, blue diversion toilet by EWAG, um, Omni ingester for pit emptying, the Omni processor for large um, thermal treatment of uh, sludge, um, pressure cooker type of um, treatment. Um, also, we have North Carolina State University with um, the excavator uh, for pit emptying. The RTI International with their system, Synergy, etc. So I haven't given any details. They're available on this guideline, which is available to download um, on the internet or um, in the course materials. So the overall conclusions of this speech. The good understanding of peak of sludge characteristic is crucial for the improved design of pit emptying devices, transport and processing systems of pico sludge. Also, they are a baseline for the design of innovative technologies for pico sludge collection, transportation and processing. And the standard operating procedures for pico sludge improve the data quality by consistency of the, um, uh, and reliability of the data, um, comparability of the results from different systems and different regions, and then um, it provides uh, database generation for FICO sludge. Thank you. For more details, please contact me or visit our website.